Okay, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Um, final Torah portion of Genesis. Um, and it's called Vayechi. It literally means, and he lived, because it says that Jacob lived 17 years in Egypt. I want to look at the blessings of the 12 tribes, and I'm technically telling a bit of a fib there. Um, we're going to look at the blessing, some of the blessings regarding Ephraim and Manasseh, and then uh, Reuben, uh, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. So they're the ones we're going to really look at. Otherwise, we'd be here for I don't know how long. But these are the ones I really want to focus on. And we're not going to do the usual Ephraim and Asher, multitude of nations, hand crossed over. We've done that before. Um, so I want to look at a different aspect of it. Um, so when it decides, there we go. So let's go to Genesis 48. And after these events, after these events is the events of the brothers, Joseph, the whole, whole of that uh, ordeal. After these events, it came to be that it was said to Yosef, see, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Yaakov was told, see, your son Yosef is coming to you. And Yisrael strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. And Yaakov said to Yosef, El Shaddai appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. Just so you guys know where Luz is, it's where, where Jerusalem would end up. And Luz means almond tree. So just interesting little thing there, link it to the almond, the rod of Elohim, anyway. <laughs> and he said to me, see I am making you bear fruit and shall increase, increase you and make you an assembly of peoples or a multitude of nations and give this land to your seed after you as an everlasting possession. And now, your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Mitzrayim, before I came to you in Mitzrayim, are mine. As Reuben, or Reuven, and Shimon, they are mine. So we see that Reuben and Simeon have been replaced with Ephraim and Manasseh. They become Jacob's. Now, what did Reuben do to forfeit his birthright? Yeah, went into his father's bed, had it off with his concubine. What did Shimon do to forfeit being next in line? Yeah, the whole Shechem incident, and we see that from the blessing, that, and we'll get to that. By the way, just to go back to Reuben, it wasn't the fact that he actually just slept with his father's maidservant. That was a usurping of authority. It was a way of... There's a really good incident. When Solomon comes to, the, to take the throne, his, one of his brothers asks his mum, will you ask Solomon if you'll give me, uh, I forget the woman's name, but she was a concubine of Solomon. Would you ask her to give her, her to me as a wife? Solomon absolutely flips out. He actually says, would you give him the crown too? So, and he has him killed because of it. Pardon? Is it in the Haftorah? Yeah. So, oh, I didn't know that. But to, to sleep with the, the either a, a, a man's concubine or wife was to seem to basically put yourself in his place. It was, it was, yeah, this is why he forfeited it. So it wasn't just the fact that there was adultery going on. It meant a lot more back then. Um, and yes, Shimon, we, we, he hamstrung an ox for pleasure and the whole Shechem incident. He, deceive, he deceivingly uh, killed a load of people with Levi. Now, why wasn't Levi or Levi included in being forfeited along with Shimon? Because they did the same thing together, right? The whole Shechem incident was both Simeon and Levi. So, I don't have the answer to this, by the way. Well, we'll see as we go forward, but why? Why is he not included in this? Well, yeah, there's the whole priesthood stuff and... But I believe actually we'll see something further down the line. So basically we have Ephraim and Manasseh replacing Reuben and Simeon, respectively. And we ultimately find out that, you know, Ephraim ends up being put over the younger, uh, over the older, sorry. Let's keep going. Your offspring whom you shall bring forth after them are yours, and let them be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. Now, this is really important because Ephraim and Manasseh were the offspring of Yosef and a Gentile bride, a, a foreign woman. Now, we've, we went through last week how Yosef was a perfect type and shadow of Messiah. Now, this should make us think of maybe the northern kingdom and the nations that they've been dispersed to. So whoever then comes in, whether they be Jew, Greek, foreigner, as long as they believe in Messiah Yeshua, 
they can then, and then the offspring of that. Does, uh, does, am I making sense? Am I making sense? So this is actually very important that uh, Jacob says these are to inherit along with the other brothers. What's the inheritance that we're waiting for? The return of Yeshua, but what specifically? Is, is that just it? Or do we long for a physical inheritance, right? Maybe a piece of land, maybe somewhere to live. Do, do you see what I'm getting at? So this is really crucial that Ephraim and Manasseh are allowed to inherit alongside with the brothers. They're to inherit along with the native brothers as well. Now, who are the brothers? Are we speaking of just Judah here? No, so we're not speaking of just the Jews. We're speaking of the northern kingdom as well and foreigners deciding to come in to attach themselves. And we'll look at this a bit further on. So this is really crucial because it means that now bloodline technically doesn't mean anything. If you're part of the family, you're part of the family. And if you're part of the family, you inherit. That's the really crucial thing. Yeah. Let's look at Isaiah 56 because people will say that, oh, well, it, it, both Jews and Christians will say that it's, um, it's always, in the Old Testament, it was about blood. And now it's about, you know, Yeshua or something. It was never about blood. Let's look at this. Isaiah 56 verse 1, thus said Yah, guard right ruling and do righteousness, for near is my deliverance, my salvation to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of a man who lays hold on it, guarding the Sabbath, lest he profane it and guarding his hand from doing any evil. And let not the son of a foreigner who has joined himself to Yah speak, saying, Yah has certainly separated me from his people, nor let the eunuch say, I am a dry tree. So Yah is saying, guys, why is he mentioning the eunuch, by the way? Is it, well, in the Torah, it says that a man with, a, uh, with crushed goods, shall we say, or someone unable to reproduce, wasn't allowed in the temple precinct, and things like that. For thus said Yah, to the eunuchs who guard my Sabbaths, plural, plural Sabbaths, and have chosen what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. So th th this, is your, this is what you need to do. You need to hold fast to his Sabbaths, choose what pleases Yah, and then hold fast to his covenant. To them I shall give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons or daughters. I give them an everlasting name that is not cut off. So this is, even Isaiah is telling you guys, it's not about where you were born into. It's about what you do. Also the sons of the foreigner who joined themselves to Yah to serve him and to love the name of Yah to be his servants. All who guard the Sabbath and not profane it and hold fast to my covenant. Them I shall bring to my set apart mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayers. This is huge because you now have quote unquote foreigners allowed into the temple precinct and into his house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their slaughterings are accepted on my altar, for my house is called a house of prayer for all the peoples. So this is not just a New Testament concept. Far from it. We have to remember Abraham was a Babylonian. People forget that. He wasn't like a Jew or an Israelite. He was a Babylonian. Yeah, he couldn't be one. <laughs> The master Yah, now this is important, who gathers the outcasts of Yisrael, declares, I gather still others to him besides who are gathered to him. Who are the outcasts of Israel? So who's speaking here first? Let's do this. Who's speaking? Yah through Isaiah. Who was Isaiah speaking to? It wasn't the northern kingdom. He was speaking to Judah. Who are the outcasts of Israel? The northern kingdom, okay? The northern kingdom of the outcasts. Who then are the others being gathered in? People from other nations, yes, Gentiles, if you want to call it that. The Goyim, the other nations. 
John 10, verse 16, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, I have to bring them as well, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one flock, one shepherd. Now, Yeshua is speaking that to Jews at the time. He's speaking that to the Pharisees, if I'm not mistaken. So he, he, it, we don't act, is he referring to the northern kingdom, or is he referring to the, the goyim as well? I'd say both fit, especially in light of Isaiah. In John 11, and one of them, Caiaphas, so we know, you know, Caiaphas, the guy who condemned him to death, being high priest that year, said to them, you know naught, neither do you consider that it is better for us that one man die for the people than the entire nation should perish. Now, at this time, they're discussing about basically getting rid of Yeshua. But he did not say this from himself. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua was about to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the children of Elohim who were scattered abroad. This was one of these verses I was like, when was that put in there? When I first came across it, it's like, what? So obviously, this tells you one of the reasons of Messiah's death, to bring in the northern kingdom. And it, but I want to bring up Isaiah 56, 8 again. The master Yah who gathers the outcasts of Israel, i.e. the northern kingdom, I gather still others to him beside those who are gathered to him. The whomsoever wills. Look, we've said this before. Israel is scattered to all nations. The gospel or the good news goes out to all nations. It means that not only do Israel get to hear this good news, but so do the nations. And they get to choose to come in or not. So again... This is all, it all starts off with this blessing. It all starts off with this blessing. And I, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way when there was but little distance to go to Ifrat. And I buried her on the way to Ifrat, that is, Beit Lechem. Now, why even mention this to Joseph? Because he's telling him, by the way, you know, you, I'm going to bless you. Your sons are mine. By the way, your mum's buried over here. I, th I think it goes a lot further than just, by the way, you need to know where your mother is buried. That wh Why go to such trouble to it? I want to go on a little journey on Ifrat, Beit Lechem. There's some really interesting things when you start connecting dots together. First Samuel 17, verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephratite of Beit Lechem in Yehuda, whose name was Yishai. And he had eight sons in the days of Shaul, the man who was old among men. So David was an Ephratite, Beit Lechem. So link this back to where Rachel has been buried. Now, who is David a type of shadow of? Yeshua. Where was Yeshua born? Bethlehem. Micah 5.2, but you, Beit Lechem Ifchata, who, you who are little among the clans of Yehuda, out of you shall come forth to me the one to become ruler in Yisrael, and his comings forth are of old from everlasting. So again, now we're connecting um, the messianic line, shall we say, through Ifchata. Let's look at the, there's some interesting things in the book of Ruth. And it came to be in the days when the rulers ruled, or the judges, that there was a scarcity of food in the land. And a man from Beit Lechem, Yehuda, went to sojourn in the fields of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Machlon and Kilion, Ephratites of Beit Lechem, Yehuda. And they went to the fields of Moab and came to be there. And Elimelech, husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. So please note, where are they coming from? They're coming from this place, Beit Lechem, Ephrata. And they took the wives of the women of Moab, the name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And Machlon and Kilion died, both of them, so the woman was bereaved of her two sons and of her husband. Now we know the story. Ruth ends up marrying Boaz through him acting as a kinsman redeemer. So link this back. You have Jacob saying to Joseph, your mother is buried in Beit Lechem Ifchata. By the way, your two Gentile sons, they're, they're part of the, of the group now. 
And now Ruth the Moabitess is joined to Boaz, but originally she was married to a guy from Beit Lechem Ifchata. Do you see the, the trail? Okay, uh, we'll bring it together. Ruth went on to have children. Now whose children are they? Ruth had children. Are they Boaz's children? No, they're not. Why are they not? Let's look at Deuteronomy 25. This is to do with kinsman redeemership. When a brother dwells, when brothers dwell together and one of them has died and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not become a stranger's outside. Her husband's brother goes into her and shall take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her, i.e. he'll give her children. And it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears does rise up for the name of his dead brother so that his name is not blotted out of Yisrael. But if the man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate of the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Yisrael. He does not agree to perform the duty of my husband's brother. And the elders of the city shall then call him and speak to him, and he shall stand and say, I have no desire to take her. Then his brother's wife shall come to him and the presence of the elders and remove his sandal from his foot and shall spit in his face and answer and say, thus it is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. This was a shameful thing, like really shameful. Um, and in Yisrael, his name shall be called the house of him who has his sandal removed. It, it was a, it, it, this honor shame thing going on here. So let's now bring this back to Ruth. Chapter 4, verse 1. Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And see, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. And Boaz said, turn aside, so and so. Sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So, that, so it's interesting. You've got ten men witnessing the whole event. Whenever I see tens in scripture, I automatically think Northern Kingdom. And then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the fields of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So Elimelech dies. Naomi is screwed, basically. So she sells the land. But remember, in her mind, she knows it comes back to her at the Jubilee. Um, and I thought that I should disclose it to you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you do redeem it, redeem it. But if you do not redeem it, inform me so that I know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I redeem it. And Boaz said, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you shall also acquire Ruth the Moabites, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead on his inheritance. And the Redeemer said, I am not able to redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. Redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I am not able to redeem it. And this was formally done in Yisrael concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm every word. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a witness in Yisrael. Now what's interesting we don't know if it happened exactly according to Torah and this man had his face spat in. You could interpret it that way. You could also say that maybe Boaz was actually trying to um, guard the, the honor of his relative by not having Ruth there and basically giving him the chance of doing this without being spat on. You could go either way. We don't actually know though. So the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. Then he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and to the peoples, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech and all that was Kilion's and Machlon's from the hand of Naomi. And also Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Machlon, I have acquired as my wife to raise up the name of the dead on his inheritance so that the name of the dead should not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his place. You are witnesses today. So we have Machlon, an Ephratite of Beit Lechem marrying a Gentile bride. He's, he marries Ruth, the Moabites. He dies with no offspring. Okay? A kinsman redeemer brings up a seed for him, thus resurrecting his name. Where was Machlon from? Beit Lechem, Ephrata. When Yeshua died, the, did he have a seed, as it were? 
Think of the parallel. He didn't. It wasn't until after his resurrection that through his blood there is a seed. Do you see the parallel here? The, the, uh, uh, to me, this is a clear type and shadow of Messiah dying and resurrecting. Anyway. And Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and Yah granted her conception and she bore a son. And the women said to Naomi, blessed be Yah who has not left you with this day without a redeemer and let his name be proclaimed in Yisrael. And he shall be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. So this means that this child was technically not Boaz's. It was the child of Mahlon. And the women, her neighbors, gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Oved. It means servant. Um, And he was the father of Yishai, the father of David. So you have this... Uh, this is where the thread from David actually comes back. But again, this is tying us back to Beit Lichem Ifchata. Rachel was buried there. Now, Rachel's son was Yosef. Yosef's two children were technically foreigners. And again, so one thing you will see with Beit Lichem Ifchata is foreigners, seed, and the messianic line. These are the connections I'm trying to bring. Again, Micah 5 2, but you, Beit Lechem Ifrata, you who are little among the clans of Yehuda, out of you shall come forth to me the one to become ruler in Yisrael. And his comings forth are of old from everlasting. So this is just like a nice little thread that we get from this place. Everyone was me. Cool. And when I came from, so back to Genesis 48, verse 7. And I, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan along the way, and, uh, but a little distance to go to Ifchat. And I buried her there on the way to Ifchat, that is Beit Lechem. Now, Rachel, Rachel, wasn't blessed with fruitfulness like Leah and the two maidservants were. Rachel only ended up having two children. The, like, the other three ladies had all these other kids. However, through Yosef's seed, she will become the mother of a multitude of nations. Because what was the blessing given to Ephraim? He shall become the multitude, the completeness of the nations. Now, Rachel's sons were Yosef, who was a type of Messiah, and Benjamin, a type of the bride of Messiah. So while she only had two sons, their types and shadows are huge, actually. Remember from last week, we showed how Benjamin was a type of the bride. Now, not long after Yaakov was promised that he would be fruitful and become an assembly of the peoples, his beloved wife, Rachel, dies. You actually see that Yah re-gives him the promise that you shall become the father of many nations. The next thing, his wife is dead. His favorite wife at that. Now, this happens near Ifrat. Now, who knows what Ifrat means? It means place of fruitfulness. So you've got this irony, like she dies, you're telling me that I'm going to be fruitful, my wife dies, and I have to bury her in a place called fruitfulness? It doesn't add up, right? It doesn't add up. It would seem that Rachel's fruitfulness has actually ended. And I believe this is how, Yah does this all the time. He, um, I've said this before, he works best when the odds are stacked up against us. Because then who gets the glory, Right? How would Yaakov continue to be fruitful if his last wife of fruit-bearing age had just died? She'd just died. Now, imagine how Yaakov would have felt when he found out that Yosef, Rahel's son, had a son called Ephraim. Who knows what Ephraim means? Ephraim means doubly fruitful. So think about that. Yaakov's just, he's promised that he'll be a fruitful multitude of nations, his last wife of fruit-bearing age dies in a place called fruitfulness. He doesn't see Joseph. He thinks he's dead. When he finally does see Joseph, and Joseph, he's, his son, through Rachel's line, he's now doubly fruitful. Can you see? It's just beautiful. Now, this is how Elohim's promise of, see, I am making you bear fruit and shall increase you and make you an assembly of peoples would be fulfilled. Do, do you see? Because who became an, an assembly of peoples? Ephraim. 
Now this would explain why Yaakov does and says this. Yisrael stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and left his left hand on Menashe's head, consciously directing his hands, for Menashe was the firstborn. And when Yosef saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it was evil in his eyes, and he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from the head of Ephraim to the head of Menashe. And Yosef said, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know my son, I know. He also becomes a people, but he, and he also is great. Yet his younger brother is greater than he, and his seed is to become the completeness of the nations, the fullness of the nations, a multitude of nations. And he blessed them on that day, saying, In you, Yisrael, shall bless, saying, Elohim, make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. I've always used to ask myself, how did Yaakov know? Did he have like this kind of prophetic revelation? He got a word from God. Or was it literally he saw that the series of events in his life, his wife dies in a place called fruitfulness. He, his son, who he thought was dead, is now alive. There's your type of resurrection. And not only that, his son is called doubly fruitful. I believe y- Yaakov would have gone, okay, And he would have known that he was put above his older brother, Esau. And his father was put above his older brother, Ishmael. So again, Yaakov must have gone, huh, it's happening again. The younger is going above the older. Fancy that. As an aside, what shape would Yaakov's arms have made when blessing Ephraim and Manasseh? A tav. That's the one I was looking for, an ancient tav. Go follow the thread on that. Messiah crucified on what would have looked like a tav. We can't get away from that. What was the sign put on people's foreheads in Ezekiel's vision? The Hebrew literally says, put a tav on their head. And I'm not talking about Ash Wednesday. Far from it. <laughs> Yisrael said to Yosef, see I am dying, but Elohim shall be with you and bring you back to the land of your father's. And I have given you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Now, this is is important because this is Yaakov giving the firstborns double portion to Yosef. And because he put Ephraim over Manasseh, that means that double portion then goes down to Ephraim. So in a family in ancient times... The head of the house, or the oldest brother, the firstborn, would be given a double portion so that he could help the running of the family. That was his job. That went to Ephraim, the the youngest, a generation down youngest. Okay, so we've done, this is Ephraim and Manasseh. I've purposely chosen not to go down the prophetic significance of the fullness of the Gentiles, as it were. Um, If people want to know more about that, the Torah portion where Abraham is given the sign of circumcision, we go to town on that, you know. Let's look at the blessings of, let's start looking at the blessings of the other brothers now. Yaakov called his sons together and said, gather together so that I declare to you what is to befall you in the last days. That literally means, as what it says, in the last days, in the end times. Gather yourself together and hear, O you sons of Yaakov, and listen to Yisrael, your father. Reuven, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my power and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of exaltation and the excellency of my power. Boiling like water, you do not excel, because you went up to your father's bed and then you defiled it. He went up onto my couch. So, And as we were going through the Torah portions, we actually saw Reuben trying to regain his father's honor several times. Uh, One of them was back in Genesis 37. Um, It says, they, uh, they, the brothers, said to each other, see, this master of dreams is coming. Now then come, let us now kill him and throw him into some pit and shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. Let us then see what becomes of his dreams. But Reuven heard this and rescued them from their hands and said, let us not take his life. And Reuven said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, in order to rescue him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. 
There's the key to bring him back to his father. Because the whole incident of Reuben sleeping with his father's maidservant happened before this. We also have Genesis 42, when the brothers are speaking to Yosef's pulling the fast one on them, basically. Um, and they said to each other, Truly we are guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the distress of his life when he pleaded with us. Yet we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuven answered them and said, Did I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against the boy? And you would not listen, and see his blood is now required of us. And they did not know that Yosef understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. So now we see Reuben actually holding his brothers to account. He's trying to regain the honor, with, even within the brothers. And then uh, further down in chapter 42... Yankov, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. Yosef is no more, and Shimon is no more, and you would take Binyamin. All this is against me. So Reuven spoke to his father, saying, Take the lives of my two sons, if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I myself bring him back to you. But he said, My son is not going down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If any harm should come to him along the way in which you go, then you would bring my, down my grey hair with sorrow to the grave. It would seem that Yaakov, well, it, it, it is that Yaakov would not send Benjamin to Egypt under the care of Reuben. Have you thought to yourself, why? Especially because he allowed Benjamin or Benjamin to go to Egypt under supervision of Yehuda. Why would he, you know, not you, Reuben, but I'll allow it with Judah. Why? We don't ask these questions. Why would he allow it? And I believe that it's a difference in character. It's a difference in character. Reuben spoke to his father saying, take the lives of my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I myself bring him back to you. Now let's see what Judah had to say. Yehuda said to Yisrael, his father, send the boy with me, let us arise and go, and live and not die, both we and you, and also our little ones. I myself shall stand guarantee for him. For my hand, from my hand you are to require him. If, you do not bring him. if I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. Can you see the difference? Well... Reuben is willing to, throw, put, he's willing to use his kids as barter. Why? What is he trying to do? He's trying to regain his honor. And he's willing to step on his kids in the process. Think of that. Judah, on the other hand, he's like, I'll do it. You, I will take the blame. He's taking responsibility. Reuben was willing to put his sons in danger, whereas Yehuda was willing to take personal responsibility. And I think Yaakov, when Reuben did this, he would have seen straight through it. You're willing to put your kids to regain that on your kids to regain my honor. That would have even shamed him further. Reuben was willing to make an oath using his sons as barter for a situation he ultimately had no control over. Now, I say the latter that he had no situation, uh, control over the situation because of our Messiah's words. Again, you heard it say that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to Yah. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by the heaven, because it is Elohim's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great sovereign, nor swear by your head, because you are not able to make one hair white or black. Don't make a promise that ultimately you can't control the situation of. But let your word be, let your word yea be yea and your no be no. And what goes beyond these is from the wicked one. That's scary, you know, when we talk too much and do the... And then in Matthew 23, when Yeshua's hounding the Pharisees, woe to you blind guides who say, whoever swears by the dwelling place, it does not matter. But whoever swears by the gold of the dwelling place is bound by oath. Fools and blind... For which is greater, the gold of the dwelling place that sets the gold apart? And whoever swears by the altar, it does not matter, but whoever swears by the gift that is on it, it is bound by oath. Fools and blind. Uh, for which is greater, the gift of the altar that sets the gift apart? 
He then who swears by the altar swears by it and by all that is upon it. And he who swears by the dwelling place swears by it and by him who is dwelling in it. And he who swears by the heavens swears by the throne of Elohim and by him who is sitting on it. He's hounding the Pharisees saying, not only are you disrespecting Yah in your oaths, because you're making your oath, but but then he says you you don't have control over it. This is why Yeshua says it's better not to swear uh, than to swear falsely. And Reuben was willing to swear by his children. I mean, think about this. Shimon's in jail. For, for all they know, he's going to be a slave for the rest of his life. And, he, and he, Reuben's still willing to bet his kids. <laughs> put it that way, he's betting his children. <laughs> so again, Reuben was willing to put his sons in danger, whereas Yehuda was willing to take personal responsibility. Reuben was willing to make an oath using his sons as barter for a situation he had no control over. Reuben was willing to put his sons in danger for self-gain. It was all for self-gain. I believe that Reuben was just like Esau. He was just like Esau. Why? Both were willing to throw away something precious for self-gain, for the immediate good now. Both tried to repent of their sin, yet were never fully restored to their original place. Why do you think Reuben is doing all this, trying to claw back some kind of honour? In Hebrews 12, it says, See to it that no one falls short of the favour of Elohim. I mean, that's a statement in of itself already. You can fall short of that favour. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble by which many become defiled. Lest there should be anyone who hoards or profane one like Esau, who for a single meal sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wished to inherit the blessing, he was rejected and he found no place for repentance Though he sought it with tears, he tried and he tried and he tried. Right. So going back to, is everyone with me? Cool. Um, Reuben's blessing by Moshe, because there was the blessings of the 12 tribes by Jacob and also by Moshe. Let Reuben live and not die and let his men be numbered. I believe we're actually seeing the Father's mercy here and his compassion extended to someone like Reuben. The blessing is saying, let him still, essentially saying, let him still be among the people and let him have his, retain his tribal identity, even though all these things. So there's actually an act of mercy there. Yet Reuben could have been greater. That's the point I want to hint at. He got a blessing, but he didn't get the blessing he ought to have. Reuben was supposed to be firstborn and have the splendor of being a firstborn and he threw it away for sex. Let's be blunt. He threw it away for sex, for immediate pleasure, usurping his father and no matter what he did, he could never... In in trying to regain that honor, he was dishonorable, willing to put his kids on the line, on and on and on. Okay, let's look at Shimon and Levi, Simeon and Levi. Shimon and Levi are brothers. Their weapons are implements of violence. Let my being not enter their council. Let my esteem not be united to their assembly. Because they slew a man in their displeasure, they lamed an ox in pleasure. Cursed be their displeasure, for it is fierce, and their wrath for it is cruel. I divide them in Yaakov and scatter them in Yisrael. We actually see this coming to fruition when the people come into the land. So we know that Levi was scattered. He wasn't given a land inheritance. And he was to be scattered throughout all 12 tribes. Yeah. Now, Simeon is this little guy here. Eventually, Simeon, over the, when the, the, the divide happened, so this is where the divide happened around here, Simeon got swallowed up by the southern kingdom. So we'll get into tribal identity in a bit, but the point I'm trying to say is that over time, Simeon's land just got swallowed up by Judah. Now, Shimon's inheritance would end up being swallowed up by the rest of the southern kingdom. It doesn't mean the tribal identity was gone, though, and we'll get to that. Now, what's interesting is when we come to Moshe's blessing of these two tribes, Levi and Simeon, Uh, In Deuteronomy 33, this is Levi's blessing. 
Your Tumim and your Urim belong to your kind one, whom you tried at Massah, with whom you contended at the waters of Meribah, who said of his father and mother, I have not seen them. And he did not acknowledge his brothers or know his own children, for they have guarded your word and watched over your covenant. This is referring to the golden calf incident where Levi slew their brothers, basically. They teach your right rulings to Yaakov and your Torah to Yisrael. They put incense before you and a complete burnt offering on your altar. O Yah, bless his strength and accept the work of his hands. Smite the loins of those who rise against him and of those who hate him, that they rise no more. That's a blessing. That's an awesome blessing to have. When Moshe blessed the 12 tribes of Israel, Shimon wasn't even given a blessing at all, whatsoever. So go back to the blessing that was given to Simeon and Levi by Yaakov. It was a bit more of a curse, really. You know, let them be spread. So what was it that changed for Levi and not for Shimon? Because they got initially the same blessing, and now when it comes to Moshe and when they're about to inherit the land... One gets an awesome blessing, one gets completely left out. There are two moments in Israel's history in the wilderness, both of which involve spiritual adultery that define both these tribes, actually. And the first one is the golden calf, and the other one is when Israel hoard with the daughters of Moab, the Balaam and Balak incident in Numbers 25. Now, in both cases, Levi was zealous for Elohim. We see here how uh, dangerously misdirected zeal can actually be redirected towards Elohim. So you have Levi, you know, he's willing to kill animals and people just for fun. And now we see him, look at him, right? He's given a priesthood. In Exodus 32, Moshe stands in the entrance of the camp and says, Who is for Yah? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves to him. And he said to them, Thus said Yah Elohim of Israel, Each one put on his sword on his side, pass over to and fro from the gate to gate in the camp, and each one slay his brother, and each one his friend, and each one his relative. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moshe, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. And Moshe said, you are ordained for Yah today, since each one has been against his son and his brother, so as to bring upon you a blessing today. I mean, just imagine having to do that. In Numbers 25, so this is the incident with the daughters of Moab. And see, one of the children of Israel came and brought to his brothers a Midianite woman before the eyes of Moshe and before the eyes of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tent. Some people will actually go as far as saying that whatever this guy did, it was done right in front of the tabernacle, precinct. And when Pinchas, son of Eleazar, son of Aharon the priest, saw it, so what tribe is Pinchas from? Levi. He saw it, he rose up among the congregation, took a spear in his hand, and he went after the man of Yisrael into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Yisrael and the woman through her belly. Thus the plague among the children of Yisrael came to a stop. So you can see Levi, uh, Pinchas, being really zealous here for Yah. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. The name of the Yisraelite who was killed, who was killed with the Midianite woman, was Zimri, son of Salu, a leader of the father's house among the Shimonites. So you have a leader of Simeon doing this whole thing. So you, again, you see this, um, uh, this dichotomy between Levi and Simeon. And the name of the Midianite woman who was killed was Cosby, the daughter of Saul. He was the head of the people of her father's house in Midian. So you have a leader going off with a foreign leader. Now, Zimri, it literally means my song, which is interesting. And I like this idea, he was literally doing things to his own tune. He wasn't listening to Moshe, you know, you know what, I'm going to do what I want. What's interesting, Cosby, this woman, her name means false, and her father... Tzu means rock, a false rock. Who is the rock of our faith, right? Messiah is the tried cornerstone. And Zimri, he's playing to his own tune, whoring out with a false rock. Interesting. As we saw, 24,000 people died in the ensuing plague. Now, remember that Zimri was a leader of Simeon, which means he would have had great influence 
What's interesting is when we look at the number of the Shimonites, the Simeonites, at the start of the Exodus and after this incident, there's the two uh, censuses. Numbers 123, you have 59,300 Simeonites. After this event, you have, that's meant to be 22,200, I think, yeah. Whoops. <laughs> that's a decrease of 37,100 Simeonites. When you look at the, the, the numbers, a couple of tribes fall below the, what they originally had, but not to this level. This is like a spike on the graph, so to speak. This makes it easy to conclude that most of the 24,000 that died in the plague were actually Shimonites. They were from Simeon. Remember, it was one of their leaders that did this. Yeah, just missing a zero, yeah. Okay, is everyone with that? So can you see the difference? Levi and Simeon start off in the same place. Zealous, but they're, it's misdirected. And then you have two events in Israel's history where one turns his zeal towards Yah, the other one is basically doing what he wants to do. Thus we see a great difference in the blessings of Moses. Let's look at John 13, Last Supper. And leaning back on the breast of Yeshua, he said to him, Master, who is it? Who will be the one that betrays you? Yeshua answered, it is he whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Yehuda from Kiriot, son of Shimon. Now, the word son is actually supplemented by the translators. So all it's saying is Yehuda from Kiriot of Simeon. Of Simeon. It was the norm to identify a person by his tribe in those days. I am, uh, I don't know, Michael, son of Pavel, of the tribe of. That's how they introduced themselves. Yehuda was most likely from the tribe of Shimon, long ago absorbed into the southern kingdom, but still remembering his family heritage. And I've put in brackets here, knowledge of one's tribe after the dispersion. Josephus speaks about, we actually know where some of the northern kingdom are. Some of them are over the Jordan, over there. How did the woman, you know when Yeshua is speaking to the woman at the well, and she says, My, our father Jacob worshipped here. And Yeshua says, you, one day you'll neither worship here, but you'll worship anywhere in spirit and truth. How did she know, being from living in Samaria area, how did she know her father was Jacob? What does that make her? An Israelite, but not a Jew. People in the first century still knew their tribal identity, guys. They also knew that the northern kingdom knew they were out of covenant to the point where the Jews actually said, well, if you relinquish your tribal identity and convert to Judaism, you can now be, still be in covenant. That was going on. But that would have been, um, it would have been shameful on the parents of the individual doing that. And after the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Yeshua therefore said to him, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew why he said this to him. For some were supposing, because Yehuda had the bag, that Yeshua was saying to him, buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give somewhat to the poor. So having received the piece of bread, he went out straight away, and it was night. So we have Yehuda leaving the party, as it were. You know, disappears off. Now, if it's after that he leaves that Yeshua blesses his disciples. In, and go read John 17. That's the chronology. After Judas leaves, uh, Yeshua has this really long spiel that he says, you know. And in John 17, he actually blesses his disciples. So, let's look at this idea of cyclical history. Things just being repeated over and over. We have Yaakov giving his last words to the 12 brothers. Shimon remains unrepentant as an individual. We have Shimon's blessing from Yaakov being more of a curse. And we see how that plays out. We have Moshe giving his last words to the 12 tribes. Shimon remains unrepentant as a tribe. Shimon is just not given a blessing whatsoever. Now fast forward, we have Yeshua giving his last words to the 12 disciples. Yehuda of Simeon remains unrepentant and removes himself from the Last Supper. Therefore, he's not blessed by Yeshua, unlike the other disciples. Again, you see the same thing happening. He receives no blessing. Everyone get that? 
Cool, I'm getting nods. Okay, let, let's just some final thoughts in this first half. Did the tribe of Shimon get to enter the promised land? Yes. What's that a type and shadow of entering the promised land? At the end days, entering into the kingdom, right? However, they entered without a blessing. Think about that. They, they were given a blessing from Jacob, which was more of a curse, and then nothing from Moses, nothing. Yet, they could have been greater. You see the same thing happening. Simeon, the brother, the individual, could have been far great. He could have been far greater. He could have received a blessing from Moshe, but he didn't. Judas, Yehuda Iscariot, he had the, the best rabbi, the best teacher. He, he had the Son of God there, and he could have been greater. It was Shimon's adultery with his father's concubine and misdirected zeal that resulted in him being cursed by his father. Uh, no, Shimon. Oh, I've, I've made a big doo-doo here. That was Reuben. Sorry, guys. For the recording, that point, I've got it wrong. I've got it wrong. It was the tribe of Shimon's spiritual adultery that, and misdirected zeal that resulted in them in being not blessed by Moshe. And what I mean here is the golden calf incident, spiritual adultery, and the daughters of Moab incident, clear spiritual adultery and some physical. It was Yehuda of Shimon's spiritual adultery, his leaven. What, what leaven did Judas have inside of him? Yeah, wrong Messiah, he had his ideas of Messiah, and his misdirected zeal that resulted in him betraying his Messiah. Judas was literally a zealot. He was looking for um, the return of Messiah. Either way, it's a shame I made that boo-boo on that point there. Oh, that would have followed really nicely, wouldn't it? Oh, I'm still falling, guys. I make mistakes. <laughs> Let's take a break here. In the second half, we're going to look at the, the, the blessing given to Judah and this idea of the scepter and Shiloh. Got some interesting things there. Um, yeah, I hope that's been a blessing and let's take a break. Amen. Okay, so let's continue with thoughts on Vayechi. Uh, we've looked at the blessing, well, the cursing of Reuben, shall we say, um, and we've looked at Simeon and Levi. Now I want to look at Judah. Um, so let's um, get started. This is a really famous blessing, a famous prophecy, as it were. As it were. Um, Genesis 49, verse 8. You, Yehuda, your brothers praise you. Your hand is on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children bow down before you. Yehuda is a lion's cub. From the prey you have gone up, my son. He bowed down, he crouched like a lion, and like a lion, who does rouse him? So this is where you get your lion of the tribe of Judah sort of motif come from. This is where it begins. The scepter shall not turn aside from Yehuda, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh, or Shiloh comes. To him is the obedience of the peoples. Now, let's just stop here. Who does the obedience of the peoples belong to? Is, or the obedience of the nations follow it? Is it from Judah or is it to Shiloh? It's from Sh Shiloh. Now, let's get that straight. Because so, people will say that the obedience of the peoples, of the nations, is to Judah. I've seen this go about before. The scepter shall, it, all it says is the scepter shall not turn aside from Yehuda. Now, the scepter, the staff, um, it's an authority thing. It's also a tribal identity. It's a tribal identity. Binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. 
His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. To whom do verses 11 and 12 apply to? Yeshua. Now people will say, I used to think this by the way, that this was speaking of Judah. You know, Judah will bind his donkey to the vine and washes. It's like, no, follow the, 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 the sentence through. It's Shiloh. Sh- to Shiloh is the obedience of the peoples, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey and so forth. So he washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. This is speaking of Shiloh. Now, if you think I'm clutching at straws, let's see what the people in the first century had to say about this. Let's look at the Targum. The Targum was the Aramaic translation of this given in the first century. Now, this is Targum Jonathan ben Uziel, who is greatly revered within Judaism. Kings shall not cease, nor rulers from the house of Yehuda, nor Saferim, teaching the law from his seed. So Saferim is a teacher of the law, basically. Um, Till the time that the king, the Meshicha, shall come. Uh, Meshichai is Aramaic. So remember, this is an Aramaic translation. The youngest of his sons, and on account of him, the peoples flow together. So this is actually referring to Isaiah's prophecy that in that day, people shall come, um, and the, the individual who has the spirit of Yah upon him. How beauteous is the king, the Meshicha, who will arise from the house of Yehuda. He hath girded his loins and descended. Interesting. He has descended. Where from? And arrayed the battle against his adversaries, slain kings with their rulers. Neither is there any king or ruler who shall stand before him. The mountains become red with the blood of their slain, his garments dipped in blood, like the outpressed juice of grapes. So this is speaking of Isaiah 63, the treading of the winepress. They've obviously got Isaiah 63 in the back of their mind when when they're reading this. How beautiful are the eyes of the king Meshichai. It's telling you straight up who they're thinking of. As pure wine. He cannot look upon what is unclean, nor the shedding of blood of the innocent, and his teeth, purer than milk, cannot eat that which is stolen or torn. And therefore his mountains are red with wine, and his hills white with corn, and with the coats of flocks. So this is what the average first century Jew would have believed, this passage of Uh, would have referred to. I actually want to even see, let's see what the ancient Jews, this is from the Babylonian Talmud. You know how I've said before how modern Judaism is a far cry from what it used to be, especially in terms of how they believed in the Messiah? Let's look at uh, how the Talmud has to, what it says. Rav says, By the way, I'm not saying this is authoritative. I'm just showing this. This is what people believed back in the day. Uh, So you're talking about 400 AD at this time, 3, 400 AD. The world was created only for the sake of David by virtue of his merit. And Shmuel says it was created by virtue of the merit of Moses. And Rabbi Yochanan says it was created by virtue of the merit of the Messiah. Apropos the Messiah, so in regards to the Messiah, the Gemara asks, what is his name? The school of Rabbi Shela says Shiloh is his name, as it is stated, until when Shiloh shall come. So even in the uh, four, in, um, 400 AD onwards, they believe that Shiloh specifically spoke of Messiah. I also wanted to keep, I read this passage and actually it was quite interesting. The, rab, uh, the school of Rabbi Yanai say Yinon is his name, as it is stated, may his name endure forever, may his name continue as long as the sun, and may men bless themselves in him. So Psalm 72, 17, um, the way that the Hebrew is, we did this in the Son of God series, by the way, how um, his name shall go forth forever, Ye- everlasting is his name. The school of Rabbi Hanina says, Hanina is his name, as it is stated, for I will show you no favor, Hanina. And then when you read the context of that passage, after this verse, it then goes on about the kingdom. So the implication is that the Messiah is the favor of Elohim. He's the one who shows favor to his people. 
And some say that Menachem, Ben Chizkiah, is his name, so Menachem, son of Hezekiah, as it is stated, because the comforter, which is Menachem, that should relieve my soul is far from me. So they've looked at Lamentations and they've said that the comfort of Israel is the Messiah. And in Lamentations, we know that Judah was cast out and the comforter was far away from Judah at that stage. Now this, you know when we were doing the blessed are you teaching and we said, who was it that comforts his people? So this is really interesting. The, the, the Jews were applying the comforter, Yah shall comfort his people, but they were also saying, well, actually the Messiah is the comforter. This one's really interesting. And the rabbi said, the leper of the house of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi is his name. As it is stated, indeed our illnesses he did not bear and our pains he endured, yet we did not esteem him injured, stricken by God and afflicted. Straight out of Isaiah 53. So Jews around the time of 400 AD believed that Isaiah 53 spoke of the Messiah, unlike today. Now it's about Israel. Okay, I just wanted to show these because, just because, <laughs> I think it's interesting. The reason they call him the leper, by the way, is because when you look at the word stricken, it's actually when someone was struck with leprosy. So this is where they had this idea of a suffering servant, a suffering Messiah. But I just wanted to show, especially the last point, that they used to believe Isaiah 53 was about the Messiah. They just happened to have missed him, unfortunately. Okay, let's go back to Shiloh. It is clear that even in the first century and after, Shiloh was thought of to be the Messiah. I mean, even in some circles now in Judaism, they believe that Shiloh is speaking of the Messiah. So again, the scepter shall not turn aside from Yehuda, nor a law given from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him, i.e. to Shiloh, is the obedience of the peoples. People will say, use this verse to say that Yehuda still holds the scepter until the millennial reign. So basically, we need to bow down to Judah's authority. People will say this. Now, who can already spot the problem with that? The Messiah has already come once. Has he, the verse is very clear. The scepter shall not depart from Yehuda nor a lawgiver between his feet until Shiloh comes, until the Messiah comes. Has the Messiah been once already? So why, so now this brings the implication, does Judah still hold the scepter? No, let's, let's keep going. Messiah having already come, and he, when he was here on earth, he said some very interesting things in regards to this. In John 3.35, the father loves the son and has given all into his hand. Everything. So who holds the authority over all? Matthew eleven twenty seven. All have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son to he whom the Son wishes to reveal. So again, who's everything being handed to? To Yeshua. John 17, verses 1 through to 3. Yeshua said these words and lifted up his eyes to the heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Esteem your son so that your son might also esteem you as you have given him authority over all flesh, including Judah. So if Yeshua has authority over Judah, who's truly holding the scepter? That he should give everlasting life to all you have given him. So not only does he hold a scepter, he can actually give everlasting life unto people. And this is the corker. Matthew 28, 18. This is after Yeshua's resurrection and he's about to ascend. Yeshua says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He has authority over creation. Who's holding the scepter? Yeshua. Yeshua is holding the scepter. Shiloh came, meaning that he took the scepter back from Yehuda. This is going to annoy some people. I'm sorry. Either that or Genesis 49 is lying to you. Matthew 21. Let, let's see something else that Yeshua said. Yeshua said to them, i.e. the Pharisees, 
Did you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was from Yah, and it is marvelous in your, our eyes. Because of this, I say to you, the reign of Elohim shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits of it. Let that sink in. The reign of Elohim shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing the forth the fruits of it. The fruit worthy of repentance. Yeshua is literally saying that authority will be taken from you. And he who falls on this stone shall be broken, but on whomever it falls, he shall be pulverized. And the chief priests and Pharisees, having heard this parable, knew that he was speaking of them. Interesting. The Pharisees had a pretty good deal, by the way. I mean, sure, they were subservient to Rome, but they, they were kushti. So let's go back to this idea of the scepter of authority. We need to know a little history. Let's do a little history lesson. The term scepter refers to Yehuda's tribal identity and the right to apply and enforce mosaic laws and to adjudicate capital offences. Capital offences, i.e. the power of life and death. So in the Torah, who, were, who, who was given to teach the word? The Levites. And what happened if you went to the priest and he didn't know? Who did you go up to? You know, you'd go up to the high priest. You'd go up the priest. So where are the priests from? Okay, now remove the northern kingdom. Who's left? It's Judah, right? Uh, I had a hand up in the back. Yeah, they just They're off. Yeah. Hang on. Let me... No, it should be... Hang on. I'll just reshare the screen. That's fine. Sorry, guys. Uh, share screen. Uh, it's coming in and out, is it? Yeah. Okay. We'll have to work on this. Okay. Okay, so I, I was, we're doing history lesson. Okay, so is every, the term here for scepter is chevet, and we've got the term mate. So we, we knew that the rod also meant tribe because the tribe was represented by the rod. So anyway, let's keep going. It's significant that even during the 70-year Babylonian captivity, and these are the estimated dates for it, Yehuda retained their own logistics, judges, and so forth. So while they were in captivity, if you look in, especially when they dispersed in Babylon, they had their own communities. What do you think the whole story of Purim is about? There, there were communities of Jewish people there, and they had a, a reasonable amount of autonomy, even though they were subservient. And more importantly, they remained their tribal identity. They remained that, they, they kept hold of that. Let's look at Ezra chapter 1. This is in the return of Judah, in the return of Judah. In the first year of Koresh, so this is Cyrus, sovereign of Persia, that the word of Yah by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, Yah stirred up the spirit of Koresh, sovereign of Persia, to proclaim throughout all his reign and also in writing, saying, Thus says Koresh, sovereign of Persia, Yah Elohim of the heavens has given me all the reigns of the earth, and he has commanded me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Yehuda. Who among you of all his who is among you of all his people? His Elohim be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Yehuda, and build the house of Yah Elohim of Israel. He is Elohim, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left from all the places where he sojourns, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and with livestock, besides the voluntary offerings for the house of Elohim, which is in Jerusalem. Now, this is verse is key. And the heads of the fathers' houses of Yehuda and Benjamin, Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all those whose spirits Elohim had stirred, rose up to go and build the house of Yah, which is in Jerusalem. This is during the captivity. And Cyrus is saying, right, guys, 
we're allowing you to go back home. Do they still have heads of fathers' houses? They have judges. This is what I'm trying to prove. They have their own autonomy. They still hold a scepter. This is the point I'm trying to prove. So again, to this point, even during the captivity, they retained their own judges and so forth. In 6 to 7 AD, King Herod's son and successor, Herod Archelaus, was dethroned and banished to Vienna, a city in Gaul. Now, Archelaus was the, son of, the second son of Herod the Great. The older son, Herod Antipater, was murdered by Herod the Great, along with other family members. After the death of Herod, Archelaus had been placed over Judea as Entarch by Caesar Augustus. Now, he was broadly rejected in the same year and removed in 67 AD and was replaced by a Roman procurator named Caponius. The legal power of the Sanhedrin as a result of this was immediately restricted the adjudication of capital cases was lost, this being a normal policy. So basically, the Romans said, we're putting our guy in. You're no longer allowed to do capital punishment. That's now our job. You can judge smaller things, but capital punishment belongs to us. Now, this transfer of power is actually mentioned by Josephus in a couple of places. In um, Wars of the Jews, book two, chapter 8.1, and now Archelaus, part of Judea, was reduced into a province. And Caponius, one of the equestrian, or one of the equestrian order among the Romans, was sent a, as a procurator, having the power of life and death put into his hands by Caesar. Caesar says, you are now in charge, a Roman, of capital punishment. This is, so you, you see the transfer of power, you see as it were, the rod, the scepter being taken from them. Let's keep going. Anti this is another quote. Antiquities of the Jews, book 20, chapter 9.1. After the, th This is a really interesting quote, by the way. After the death of procurator Festus, when Albinus was about to succeed him, the high priest Anani Ananias considered it a favorable opportunity to assemble the Sanhedrin. So remember, the Sanhedrin was still operational, but they just weren't allowed to do capital punishment anymore. He caused, therefore caused James, the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, and several others to appear before this hastily assembled council and pronounced upon them the sentence of death by stoning. This is after Yeshua has risen, by the way. This is after. All the wise men and strict observers of the law who were at Jerusalem expressed their disappro disapprobation of this act. Some even went to Albinus himself, the Roman guy, who had departed to Alexandria to bring this breach of the law under his observation and to inform him that Arrhenius had acted illegally in assembling the Sanhedrin without Roman authority. If you read, uh, this is where we get the... Um, I think the Talmud speaks of this as well. They, they chucked James off the temple roof and then clubbed his head afterwards because he survived. But the, notice that it was illegal for them to pronounce upon them the sentence of death. It wasn't that the Sanhedrin had come together. It was that they pronounced capital punishment without the authority of um, Albinus. So it was considered, it was an illegal move. So again, why do they not have the power to condemn their own people to death? The scepter's been taken from them, I would suggest. We even get an echo of this in John chapter 18. This is during Yeshua's trial. Then they led Yeshua from Caiapha to the palace, and it was early. And they themselves did not go into the palace, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate therefore came out and said to them, what accusation do you bring this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. The Yehudim said to him, it is not right for us to put anyone to death. So Pilate is, oh, does he keep doing it? Let me just finish this one. 
Pilate is saying that they're allowed to judge people. Notice that. Judge him according to your law. That's fine. The problem is that they want to put him to death and they know they don't have the power to do so. Does that make sense? Where's their scepter gone? Where's the scepter gone? So can everyone see that essentially the Jewish people had their hands tied to their back? They could only go, they, they, they can only adjudicate a certain amount of authority. Well, what's with the scepter then? I thought the scepter was into their hand. Thus they were able to judge and do everything accordingly to the law of Moshe, according to Torah. Ah, I can hear someone murmuring in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the jus gladi, that's the Latin term for the right to impose the death sentence, it had been removed from Judah. It had been removed from them. The remaining authority of Yehuda had been taken away by the Romans in the early years of the first century. Now, the, the, I put 6 to 7 AD, the, 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 these are approximate dates. The scepter had departed from Yehuda. Its royal and legal power were removed. It was completely removed. Where was Shiloh? Now, we can look back in hindsight and go, ah, Shiloh, the Messiah. He, he was there at the time. 6 to 7 AD, Yeshua's a young lad. But where was Shiloh? Okay, let's do some sorting fact from fiction. So while I was researching this topic, I actually came across some really poor scholarship from the Christian side, really bad scholarship. I mean, stuff that when you, it doesn't take much to dig down and realize that it's like, come on guys. And I'm not talking about just small people, I'm talking notable figures. Um, okay, I'll, I'll mention it, Chuck Missler, I'm mentioning him because he's dead now, I can say this. Right? But he, he, this was something, there's a couple of quotes that are being parroted. Um, who knows studylight.com? It's a bit like Bible Hub. They have really good referencing website, but they host, people write articles for them sometimes. And this guy is writing in an article. I've seen at least four or five books that have been sold that are parroting these things, and it's just really bad scholarship. You know, um, anyway, th this will make more sense as we go across. There's some major figures that they're parroting each other. And then what happens? Because these bigger people say this stuff, all the other little small time, and I mean that respectfully, but the smaller Christian figures then copy that and then put it in their books. Like I said, I've seen at least four or five books, and we'll, we'll go through this stuff. Some big time Christian ministries, and it's like... They've obviously heard it and taken it for granted. Why, well, if he's saying it, it must be true. And this becomes evident as you dig a bit deeper. In almost all cases, there is using quotes that are referenced completely incorrectly. So they'll say, this is where we got the quote from, and that reference is, it, that's not where they got the quote from. So th this poses a problem. If two or more people are saying, this is where this quote's come from, this means that, one of them's put the quote out. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say they genuinely made a mistake. All the other people that have copied have not done, they've not followed the quote through and referenced it, if that makes sense. They've not followed the source because had they, they'd realise there's a problem. Twisting of sources to suit one's own agenda to the point where it's literally, they're taking a Jewish source and making it say the opposite thing. If you're going to quote a Jewish source, just... Be honest with it, right? Using quotes that simply do not exist. There's one quote in particular, and we'll go through this, and I wish it was true. I really wish, because it really pro pro props up the argument of Yeshua being Shiloh and so forth, but it's simply not true. But I want to say so far that everything we've covered so far stands. This is why I use Josephus, um, and we're going to see that actually the Talmud corroborates what Josephus said about them losing the right to impose a death penalty. So that's a fact. It's a historical fact. But you know when we were doing the Hanukkah teaching, we are saying people over-paganize Christmas? People are doing the equivalent of that with this. You know, just to, anyway. This is one of these quotes. 
A little more than 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the power of pronouncing capital sentences was taken away from the Jews. Now, the quote they're putting here is Jerusalem Talmud, Sanhedrin, that's a tractate within, so the way the Talmuds are done, you have the Talmud, then you have like Sanhedrin. This is to do with laws and judgments and court cases. And then the folio is basically like a chapter within that. And these tractates are ridiculously long. This is another quote. When the members of the Sanhedrin found themselves deprived of their right over life and death, a general consternation took possession of them. They covered their heads with ashes and their bodies with sackcloth, exclaiming, Woe unto us, for the scepter has departed from Judah and the Messiah has not come. That's a really good quote, right? It would really fortify our standpoint. And this quote, these two quotes have just been, they're everywhere. Whenever you research Shiloh, the scepter, these will come up. Now, first notice the problems in sourcing. So here, the, the quote here is Babylonian Talmud. It doesn't even mention the tractate. Now, this is really important because the Talmud has over 20 different tractates. Some of them have over 80 chapters. And one chapter is ridiculously long. So you're telling me it's chapter four folio or section 37, what tractate? That's a big blunder. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but this one is the same as this one. Jerusalem, Talmud, Sanhedrin, to a folio 24. Why are people, like, and I'm looking at different Christian sources that are saying this, one of them is lying. <laughs> You can't have two completely different quotes. Do you see what I'm trying to point at? After much digging, this quote up here, I actually found the original source to this quote. This quote does exist, or thereabouts. The Gemara continues its question, and it is taught in a baraita. A baraita is just like a teaching. 40 years before the destruction of the second temple, the Sanhedrin was exiled from the chamber of hewn stone and sat in the store near the temple mount. And Rabbi Yitzhak Bar Avodimi says the intent of the statement concerning the relocation of the Sanhedrin is to say that they no longer judge laws of fines. So basically there's a question, was this rabbi judging laws of fines uh, before the destruction of the temple? Some people say yes, some people say no. The Gemara asks, does, oh, have I missed the slide? No. The Gemara asks, does it enter your mind to say that they would no longer judge laws, laws of fines? It is known that the Sanhedrin would judge laws of fines for hundreds of years after the destruction of the temple. Rather, he must have said that the Sanhedrin no longer judged cases of capital law. Once the Sanhedrin left the chamber of hewn stone, the court's power to judge capital cases was nullified. Now, what have we just read that Josephus was quoted saying? That they were not allowed to do capital punishment. So here the, the Talmudic source is corroborating what Josephus is saying. It keeps going. The Gemara concludes its question, and since we learn in a Mishnah, uh, Sukkah 41a, once the temple was destroyed, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai instituted an ordinance that the mitzvah of lulav, so as in waving the lulav, should be performed even in the rest of the country for seven days in commemoration of the temple. It is clear that he was in a position of prominence after the destruction of the temple. So what they're saying is this guy ordered that even after the temple is destroyed, you still wave the lulav, showing that they still had some form of rule. They still had a form of authority, as it were. Since the Sanhedrin ceased judging cases of capital law 40 years before the destruction of the temple, who died around that time? Yeshua. And the Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was in a position of prominence for only 40 years. He could have not been a judge in a capital case. So this is what they're, they're, they're arguing. Was, did he judge a capital case? Did he judge a trivial case? But from that, they're telling, and by the way, this is the proper quote. It's actually from the Babylonian Talmud, not the Jerusalem Talmud. Two completely different Talmuds. And this is the, like, it took me ages to find this, by the way. But they're telling us, yeah, we, 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 we lost the right to, we weren't allowed to judge capital uh, cases, i.e. death sentences. So, 
what this top quote is wrong. That's not where the source comes from. This is in fact the correct source. So again, here's the pro here's the problem though. The quote may be true, but it's referenced completely incorrectly by big names within Christianity. Like that, uh, this is supposed to be scholarly academic circles. While this may seem true, some people, okay, they, they just quoted it wrong. It, it's a real lack of scholarship, even from larger Christian figures, because I've seen more than one large Christian figure, I'm talking three or four big names, all parroting this, which means that at least, well, only one of them can make the mistake and the rest didn't do their scholarly duty. They didn't go fact check it. What do you think, what kind of uh, witness do you think that gives to the Jewish people? who know their sources very, very well. We look like idiots to, when we do stuff like this. This does not help our credibility whatsoever. Because let's remember, Jew, a, a religious Jew will know their sources. They'll be able to say, well, you, you're lying. Either that or you've not done the research. Let's look at this second. So the previous quote, it exists, but it's very badly referenced, okay? Very badly. Let's look at this quote. This is the um, hole in one, shall we say, the one that we, you know, woe to us for the scepter has departed from Judah, the Messiah has not come. So this paints the picture that they thought the word of Yah had been broken because they knew of the prophecy and suddenly the, the, um, the Romans take away their right to do capital cases and they're thinking, where's the Messiah? The word of Yah has been broken. And we would know, well, Yeshua is alive at that time. So, we, you know, this would be a really good thing to have on our side. Yes. Well, okay, is Yeshua in Egypt? Um, Yeshua went to Egypt when he was two. I personally believe that Yeshua was born September 11, 3 BC. That's another topic. By the... Anywhere between, so the Josephus and what he says implies that the right, the, the Yus Gladi was removed around 6 to 7 AD. The Talmud puts it to 40 years before the temple. So it's in that time. But interestingly, this takes you to the crucifixion of Messiah. So what you're saying, Messiah was in Judah, that he was in Israel. He was in Israel, wherever you go from 6 to 7 AD onwards. Now, again, this quote, I found two sources for it. This quote seems to be pushed by many people, including large figures within Christianity. This is like the go-to, the go-to. Why? Because obviously the implication is huge on this one. It implies that the rabbis were going, oh my goodness, we've missed it. I've seen at least five books and countless websites use this quote. Like, and on and on. Like, I didn't even do a very big search on this. Again, there are huge discrepancies in the referencing. Why am I getting the same quote from just completely different sources? At least someone's lying. This quote comes from a book called Jesus Before the Sanhedrin by Augustine Le Mans. Uh, it was written by a French guy. This is the translated title. The original one is a lot longer. <laughs> Augustine came from a rich Ashkenazi family in Lyon and converted to Catholicism at 18, in 1854 at the age of 18, along with his twin brother, Joseph. He and his twin brother became priests at the age of 24. So they're young, you know. Um, they were very close to Pope Pius IX. Fancy that and took part in the first ecumenical council of the Vatican. I don't know about you guys, but that screams dodgy to me, okay? That really screams, because we know how we can trust Catholicism for saying the truth, okay? <laughs> I'm not trying to like deride them, but still. These, not only were they close to the Pope, these were made honorary canons of Lyon, Beauvais, Bourges, Langres, Reims, and Montpellier. These are some of the major cities in France and to be an honorary canon meant you were allowed to partake in the service, but you wouldn't get paid, as it were, because you were being paid from something else. But, so these guys are not just your average priest. They're like, up there. Probably something to do with being close to Pope Pius. He probably wasn't that pious either. <laughs> yeah, not that pious. 
The main problem is that this quote doesn't actually exist in the Talmud. I'm telling you, I really, really tried to find it. I read a load of material that, frankly, I, you know, it, it, it's lengthy, okay? But it's sim I'm, I'm, I wish this existed. I really wish it did. But it doesn't. I've read all the possible tractates that this could possibly be in because there's several places that talk about judicial law and th things like that. So I did the legwork on it. Not only does it not exist, the language and the prose doesn't fit. So if someone says, well, maybe they edit it out, you can't make it fit back in. It, it would be like, you know, talking about A, 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 and all of a sudden the letter M comes along and then A, A, A. It wouldn't fit if you were to put it back in. Does that make sense? I, I really wanted this to be like not the case, but it is. Now, does this cause a problem? Because obviously I'm making, people will use this to say that Yeshua was Shiloh, he took the thing, the, the scepter back. This is why I use Josephus and also the Talmud to confirm what Josephus says. Other Roman writers will speak of this. That doesn't change the fact that Judah lost the Yus Gladi. They lost that. That doesn't change. But again, it's this over-paganizing of things, right? Let's over-compensate, shall we say. We know factually that the Yus Gladi was taken from the Jewish Sanhedrin, as both Josephus and the Talmud attest to this, and also Roman sources. So we've got our multiple witnesses. While certain Christian scholars have been a little careless with their referencing of the above point, with, and the carelessness comes with the rabbinical writings. It's only with the rabbinical writings. Another thing I've seen is people will quote Josephus and the referencing's completely wrong on Josephus. That happens a lot as well. Despite all that, the f above fact still stands. Judah lost the youth gladi. That's inarguable. Shiloh has to come in order for the word not to be broken. Does that, that, doesn't, that still stands. This means that either the scepter was taken away from Yehuda before Shiloh came, and Yaakov's blessing and ultimately Elohim's word is now null and void. This is, what, this is one side. Or the lion of the tribe of Yehuda came and took back his scepter. That's the only way. So this, you know, that stands. Just don't take, just don't try and make something up or read something that seems very convincing and then not fact check it to prop up your point. There's something else that we can use to give credence to this. So, yeah, let's go, let's go there. Daniel 9. Know then and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, until Messiah the Prince is very clear, is seven weeks and 62 weeks. So seven, 62, there's your 69. Uh -huh. It shall be built again with streets and a trench, but in times of affliction. That bit's key. Keep that to the back of your mind. And after the 62 weeks, so remember, you've got seven weeks, then 62. So after the 62 is 69, Messiah shall be cut off and have nothing. And the people of a coming prince shall destroy the city and the set-apart place. And the end of it is with a flood and wastes are decreed and fighting until the end. This passage clearly tells us that the Messiah has to come after 69 weeks and that he will be cut off before the temple is destroyed. It's, you know, that, that's simple reading. By the way, this is Gabriel's uh, elucidating. Daniel's saying, what does all this mean? And this is what Gabriel says to him. Like, he's helping him understand. At the time of this prophecy, the first temple and Jerusalem, it's in ruins. There's not even anyone living there. And the second had not even yet been built. Jerusalem and the temple are desolate at this stage. The second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Do, do people see where I'm going with this? This means that Messiah had to come and be cut off all before 70 AD. Now, why does this, funnily enough, tie into the same sort of rough time period as what Shiloh seems to be pointing to? It's like it's coming from two different angles. Using the, okay, weeks of years in Daniel's prophecy, so... A week is seven years. 
So you make it weeks of years. So 69 weeks becomes 483 years. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Yeah, it says six, set, you know, there's 69 weeks. You make them weeks of so uh, jubilee, not jubilee, uh, shmita cycles. That's one shmita cycle is a week of years. 69 weeks becomes 483 years. The decree to rebuild Jerusalem occurred roughly 457, some say 458. We don't know exactly by King Artaxerxes. 483 years later takes us to 27 AD or 28 AD if you think it's 458. Again, what's happening roughly at this time? If Yeshua is born around 3 BC, you're now 30 years later. Is someone starting their ministry maybe? Really, if, hmm, funny that. Now, I, I want to make a point because the decree, there's, I don't know if Ian will know this. There's in fact, yeah, there's three separate decrees for the rebuilding of Jerusalem and his temple. Well, actually, I tell a lie, for the rebuilding of the temple. There's the key. There's three decrees. The first one is the decree of Cyrus. You can see this in Ezra 1. And that was about 4, 537 B.C. Now, there is no mention of the building of the city itself, nor its wall, only that of the temple. Now, what's in, what you need to know is that a city was only a city when it had a wall around it. It wasn't a city otherwise. Otherwise, it was a village or a town. Then there's the decree of Darius, Ezra 6, 518 BC. This is a renewal of the aforementioned decree. Thus, there is no mention of the building of the city itself, nor its wall, only that of the temple. Now, from the decree of Cyrus, you do have Jews slowly going back and going back to Judah. But Jerusalem was not rebuilt. They didn't have its wall. And then decree of Artaxerxes. This is Ezra 7, 457, 458 BC. This decree resulted in the rebuilding of Jerusalem and its wall under Nehemiah. So this is how we know it's speaking of this decree. We know the story of Nehemiah, right? Um, this is how we know that this is the decree which was in the prophecy of Daniel that was fulfilled. Because what did Nehemiah do? He rebuilt the wall. Was it easy going? No, it wasn't easy going. What does Daniel's prophecy say? It shall be built again with streets and a trench, but in times of affliction. This is how we know it has to be the third decree. It's the only one that fits this bit of in times of affliction. Therefore, we can ascertain it was Artaxerxes' decree which started the prophetic clock of the 70 weeks of years. There's... And what's really, yeah, let's look at the third decree. I found this really interesting verse. And you, Ezra, this is the king speaking to Ezra, according to the wisdom of your Ella that is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges to judge all the people who are beyond the river. Does that sound like authority there? As such, all, uh, all such as knows the laws of your Ella and teach those who do not know them this verse is the corker. Whomever does not do the law of your Ella and the law of, your, of the sovereign, let judgment be promptly executed on him, whether it be death, banishment, confiscation of goods, or imprisonment. I bring this up because this is proof that Yehuda still had the scepter at that stage, as Shiloh hadn't yet come. We're talking 457 BC. The king is... Well, but essentially, the king is saying, I'm giving, you've, you've got the right to do the death penalty, guys. So they still had the scepter at that stage. It's only when you get to the first century. I just want to throw in something. I've not included it in this, but um, the Essenes and the Qumran community, those who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were expecting Messiah to come in the first century. Why do you think there was so much messianic fervor in the first century? Do you think it had something to do with Daniel's prophecy? If you read the Qumran scrolls, they'll say as such. Okay, let's look at some more poor scholarship. 
again, when I was researching this, you know, the, the whole Daniel 70 weeks, I again found really poor scholarship from Christian figures. Like, I'm not trying to pick on Christianity, but as a teacher, I'm supposed to stand for truth, and whether it be truth on either side. Again, where they, where they fell short is how they use Jewish sources to prop up their argument. Look, I don't have a problem with you using a Jewish source. I did it earlier. You know, but don't twist it, don't bend it, just let it speak for what it says. Incorrect referencing comes up again. Bending the sources to suit one's own agenda. And again, just using non-existent sources. Like, <laughs> truth will stand by itself. You don't need to bend stuff and make up stuff uh, to make truth stand. Does that make sense? I believe Yeshua is the Messiah through and through. You don't need to bend other sources to prove that point. But So this is apparently, um, who knows Maimonides, Rambam. This is a quote apparently of Maimonides. But Daniel has elucidated to us the profundities of the knowledge of the end times. However, since they are secret, the wise, and he's referring to their, his rabbis there, the wise, may, may their memory be blessed, have barred the calculation of the days of the Messiah's coming so that the untutored populace will not be led astray when they see that the end times have already come, but there is no sign of Messiah. For this reason, the wise, may their memory be blessed, have decreed, cursed it be he who calculates the end times, but we cannot assert that Daniel was wrong in his reckoning. So what, what the quote is saying is, well, we know that Daniel points to this particular time, but we don't teach that because if not, the people are going, well, hang on. If Daniel says this, that means the Messiah's already come. Where's the Messiah? So this is what they're claiming. <laughs> I'm sorry, this quote does not exist. And I've seen this parroted. In par this is Maimonides Igeret Teman. So it was a letter he sent to his Jewish uh, folk over in Teman. And this is chapter 3, page 24, okay? I'm, I've tr I, I read the whole of this letter. It's long. It's long, and that quote does not exist in it anywhere. And I checked it from multiple sources. This is the closest thing I could find to it. I found something ironically close, but it was almost an inversion of it. Inasmuch as Daniel has proclaimed the matter a deep secret, our sages have interdicted the calculation of the time of the future redemption. So that still holds. Or the reckoning of the period of the advent of the Messiah, because the masses might be mystified and bewildered should the Messiah fail to appear as forecast. What's he hinting at here? False starting guns. Uh, is Christianity bad at doing this? Well, guess what? So were the Jews. Both sides were saying, the Messiah, the Messiah, and what would happen? It would fall through. The rabbis invoke God to frustrate and destroy those who seek to determine precisely the advent of the Messiah because the masses might be mystified and bewildered should the Messiah fail to appear as forecast. It doesn't say anything about because they're going to figure out that it's been and gone. The rabbis, so let's look at this. Um, uh, may the rabbis invoke God to frustrate and destroy those who seek to determine precisely the advent of the messianic era because they are a stumbling block. And that is why they uttered the imprecation, may the calculators of the final redemption come to grief. Sanhe and this is a quote from the Sanhedrin. He's not attacking... Um, okay, what he is attacking is false starts. People that are making um, an assumption, this is when the Messiah will be, and then it not come to pass. But nowhere does it say anything to do about um, Daniel knew the time. Now, this is actually where it is in the book. You'll find this quote, they say, chapter 3, page 24. It's, not even, it's in chapter 7. And it's almost, they're, they're twisting it to say something that is not there. I'm not sticking up for Maimonides. I'm just sticking up, don't twist stuff. Not only is this badly referenced, I, this is pretty much the opposite of what these Christian sources are claiming the passage to say. 
It's not saying Daniel knew the end times and we don't teach them that so that they don't freak out and go, where's the Messiah? They say, no, we hate stumbling blocks because you're leading people astray. Many notable Christians have used the twisted version to support their thesis. Again, you can go read it. Again, I'm just trying to bring clarity to the subject. It doesn't change that Daniel's prophecy points to when Yeshua is alive. That doesn't change. Just don't twist a Jewish source because, again, they'll call you out on it. This is another quote. And actually, this one's... Pretty good, actually. In the Targum of the Prophets, in Tractate Megillah 3a, this is a Christian source, by the way. I'm quoting a Christian source here. In Tractate Megillah 3a, which was composed by Rabbi Jonathan ben Uziel, we read, And the voice from heaven came forth and exclaimed, Who is he that has revealed my secrets to mankind? Uh, you've got to remember, Jonathan ben Uziel was the guy who did the Targums. That's why they're saying this. He further sought to reveal by a targum the inner meaning of the hagiographer, a portion of scripture which, Daniel, which includes Daniel. So basically he's saying, um, who revealed my secret in the book of Daniel? But a voice from the heaven went forth and said, enough. What was the reason? Because the date of the Messiah was foretold in it. In this amazing commentary of the Targum of the Prophets, the writer expressed the knowledge that Daniel's prophecy referred to the coming of the Messiah. So this is what the Christian source. So there's a Christian source quoting a Jewish source, and they're using that to say, well, they knew when Daniel, when it pointed to. It's a, it's a I don't know. Most of that is actually true. It's partially true, but they've actually left out a whole bit. And actually, by leaving a bit out, they've, I feel they've actually done us a little disservice. The sourcing, again, is not correct. It's just not correct. And again, people are parroting this as this is the truth. Because this is the quote. It says, this Christian guy is saying, in the Targum of the Prophets, in Tractate Megillah 3a, which was composed by Rabbi Jonathan ben Uziel. This passage, Megillah 3a, is actually from the Babylonian Talmud, not from the Targum of the Prophets. The Targum of the Prophets is the Aramaic translation of the Hebrew prophets. Completely separate work. Completely separate. Secondly, um, I've got this as a point. The, the passage, when you actually read the passage, it speaks of Jonathan ben Uziel that he had written a Targum of the Prophets, but he wasn't actually the author of that passage itself, as the Christian source is saying. The Christian source is saying, this is from Targum of the Prophets written by Jonathan ben Uziel. That's not true. <laughs> Again, showing... It doesn't make us look good. Basically, if you're going to quote the source, quote it correctly. Let's look at what the source actually So This is from the Babylonian Talmud, not from the Targum. The Aramaic translation of the prophets was composed by Yonatan ben Uziel. So again, he's not the author. He's being spoken of. Based on a tradition going back to the last prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. The Gemara relates that when Yonatan ben Uziel wrote his translation... That's what Targum means, translation. So when Jonathan ben Uziel wrote his Targum, Eretz, so the land of Israel quaked over an area of 400 parasangs by 400 parasangs, and a divine voice emerged and said, who is this who has revealed my secrets to mankind? Jonathan ben Uziel stood up on his feet and said, I am the one who has revealed your secrets to mankind through my translation. You know, I know, it's a, it's a little farcical, but... However, it is revealed and known to you that I did not do this for my own honour and not for the honour of the house of my father, but rather it was for your honour that I did this so that discord should not increase among the Jewish people. In the absence of an accepted translation, people will disagree about the meaning of obscure verses. But with a translation, the meaning will be clear. And Jonathan ben Uziel also sought to reveal a translation of the writings. So the writings is like Song of Songs, Job, all these things. But a divine voice emerged him and said to him, it is enough for you that you translated the prophets. The Gemara explains, 
What is the reason that he was denied permission to translate the writings? Because it has in it a revelation of the end. In the writings, when Messiah will arrive, the end is foretold in a cryptic manner in the book of Daniel. And were the book of Daniel translated, the end become manifestly revealed to all. So it's, it's partially true what this guy was saying, but he's quoting it very badly. And what's really interesting, this shows that they believe the writings pointed to Messiah. I'm not saying that any of this is true. What this is showing is that this is what they believe. Who's read the book of Esther? The book of Esther is full of bridal stuff. Absolutely full. Even down to the year, like Esther had to prepare a whole year before she went to see the king. How long does a husband prepare his house for? A year. Like, it's full of it. So, do you see what I'm trying to get at? It's like, they kind of, yeah. And clearly they believe that, you know, Daniel points to the end. Now, I've looked at how Jewish people interpret Daniel 70 weeks. And man, do they have to do some hopscotching to, to get around the, the, the interpretation. I mean, I've seen some really good ones. So let's kind of tie it all together. The Messiah had to come and be cut off before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That's what the 70 weeks of Daniel points to. Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy points to roughly 27 AD, 28 AD, depending on how accurate our uh, historical sources are. Yehuda lost the use gladi, the death penalty right, around 6 to 7 AD. That's according to Josephus. I can only think of one person that fits the bill. Shiloh came, took his scepter, was cut off, then resurrected, all before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. I don't need extra twisted Jewish sources to point to that. History enough and scripture is pretty good on that. You know, I'm putting here some researching tips because my wife will tell you I was genuinely angered by the poor scholarship. I was like, what are they doing? Like, when using sources, fact check them, fact check them. Seriously, fact check them. Just because it's a source being said by a big person, fact check it. When using sources, don't bend them for your own agendas. That's, it's disingenuous. It's disingenuous. Or don't, you know, actually do the legwork to see if it's true. Stop parroting something just because some large figure is saying it is so. Because I, I'm, I, five books, countless websites, and to the point where I even saw one person's website, they must have literally copied and pasted the thing on studylight.org. Like, to the word. I'm like, come on. Like, if you're going to copy, paste, give, do you know what I mean? Ah. But no one's checking it. Oh, well, they're saying it's true. It must be true. When someone lists their sources, don't assume that they're correct simply because the author has listed them. Because I, this, uh, this source that was given by the French priest, the Catholic guy, people will put the sourcing. They'll say, oh, it comes from this, that, and the other. When you go there, it's not there. So all these people are copying and pasting a source that doesn't exist. And there's a reference there. So people are thinking, oh, well, they've referenced it. It must be there. Go check it. Go check it. Okay, let, let's kind of wrap this up. Going back to the idea of the scepter, the scepter allows the bearer to adjudicate Torah within the nation. Can we agree on that? Like, including the death penalty. We've established that Messiah has taken the scepter back. So it's not in the hand of Yehuda anymore. It's in Messiah's hand. The problem is, is Messiah isn't here on earth. So here's my question. Has Messiah left people here on earth to adjudicate matters here on earth? I'm seeing a yes. I heard fivefold. And he himself gave some as emissaries and as prophets and some as evangelists and some as shepherds and teachers for the perfecting... Ah. Hey. Okay, let me reshare that. Um, 
it dropped out. Yeah, I can see that. Um, man, this is going to look amazing on, on the video. <laughs> yeah, Pip's got work to do, eh? For the perfecting of the set-apart ones to the work of service, to a building up of the body of Messiah, until we all come to the unity of belief and of the knowledge of the Son of Elohim, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the completeness of Messiah, so that we should no longer be children tossed and borne about by every wind of do- teaching, by the trickery of men in cleverness and to the craftiness of leading astray. These are a gift from Messiah to his body. He's given judges, as it were, people that, uh, to have a certain form of authority. Again, whose authority is it? It's not their own, it's Messiah's. 1 Corinthians 5. I wrote to you in my letter not to keep company with those who whore. And I certainly did not mean with those of this world who whore, or with the greedy again, or the swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. I love Paul's sarcasm here. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone called a brother if he is one who hauls or greedy of gain or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are inside? The scepter, authority, the ability to judge within the body. But Elohim judges those who are outside and put away the wicked from among you. So Paul's saying, guys, you need to judge within you. If anyone's out of line, put them outside, then that's Elohim's business. But the point is, there's an authority, there's a scepter, as it were. And then he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 6, should any of you holding a matter against another go to be judged before the unrighteous and not before the set-apart ones? Do you not know that the set-apart ones shall judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters, i.e. now? What was going... It becomes evident, but people were going to pagans to, to sue each other. And Paul is saying, what are you guys doing? You should be doing this amongst yourselves. Do you not know that we shall judge messengers? How much more than matters of this life? Paul's saying, if we're going to judge the the angels, we need to be judging now. How much more now? So Paul's saying, again, there's authority. If then you truly have the judgments of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are the least esteemed by the assembly, i.e. the pagans? Why are you going to those that the assembly doesn't esteem to be judged? You should be doing this within yourselves. I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise one among you, not even one who shall be able to judge between his brothers? So I'm saying all this because obviously Messiah is not here judging on earth. There's a problem of that scepter. I believe he's allowing, he's sharing that authority with those he appoints and anoints to do so. Do people see that? So the scepter, this brings up the question of, you should, Paul says that these, the prophets, the emissaries, the te- all that, they're here until the unity of faith, that until we become the perfection, fully grown into the image of Messiah. I'm sorry, that's not there yet. Which means that there are prophets, there are evangelists, there are shepherds. It's our job to find those that Yah has truly appointed and anointed. So there is an, a, a, a scepter here on earth. It just doesn't belong to just Judah. It belongs to those whom Messiah goes, you know what, I can use you. Now, this would be all of Israel. Does that make sense? Including the foreigners that have come in and become Israel. That will annoy a lot of people. More final thoughts. More final thoughts. I actually believe that the prophecy of Shiloh taking up his scepter has a twofold fulfillment. I literally, that it occurs twice. Hear me out. When Messiah came the first time, he reclaimed his authority, right? He says, all authority has been given unto me. All authority has been given unto me. So that's when he comes. In the rod of Elohim teaching, we established that the rod of Elohim was a type and shadow of the bride, i.e. the scepter. When Shiloh returns the second time, who is he coming for? The bride. 
the scepter. <laughs> um, okay, the pennies drop. Do you see what I'm saying? He reclaims his authority the first time, and then while he's away, you know, 2,000 years, he's in the heavenly temple interceding for us. That authority is going to those, the prophets, the emissaries, the teachers. He comes back again. Shiloh takes up his scepter. Yeah, did you see what I'm trying to get at? But this time it's his bride. Absolutely beautiful. That, I was like, whoa, that absolutely stunned me. I hope that's been a blessing. I know it's been a long teaching. I know it's like very factual, a lot of bless, uh, blessing, a lot of information. Um, but yeah, all of this going back to the blessing of the 12 tribes. Amen.